me introduce Lucas to you. Lucas Schrenk is a master's student at the Technical University of Munich, currently working on his master's thesis at MIT within the Strategic Engineering Research Group. He's one of the team leaders of the Interstellar Space Flight Research Group within the WARR, the Student uh, Scientific Research Group for Space Flight and Rocketry in Munich. The team is working on interstellar fusion propulsion as part of Project Icarus and participated and won the Project Dragonfly design competition, which was hosted by the Initiative for Interstellar Studies, uh, which is an interstellar laser sail propulsion design team. The, uh, the, the team over at, um, at Munich was, was very similar to the chapter, actually. So they were based on, they were based at the University of Munich. There was, they, they had four or five team members. They had an interstellar working group. And uh, you know they came and they joined they joined Icarus Interstellar you know early on, and and have participated really meaningfully since. I, I have a lot of I have a lot of respect for the for the team and for their leader Andreas Hein, and Lucas is is uh, is done a really fascinating work. I'm really looking forward to to your talk. Thank you, Andreas. So first of all, thank you that I have the possibility to be here. It's Great and amazing, my first Starship Congress, and I hope there will be more following. Um, what you see here, that was our team. So we have, were not that lucky and had a constant growth rate like the Drexel chapter. We, had a, uh, we are now basically just two people still working on the design. And it's difficult to get new students into interstellar spacecraft uh, theoretical design when they design rockets and CubeSats next door at the same organization. So that's one thing we have to uh, address in the next uh, couple of months, I guess. And what I will talk about is shortly about Project Icarus because um, our project leader, Rob Sweeney, told me that I'm the most senior member of Project Icarus presenting at Starship Congress. Which, uh, I have the honor to do this introduction and then talk about our ghost design, about the spacecraft propulsion mainly and the important part of the spacecraft bus and then make a conclusion, which may not be as positive as the Drexel results are, but it's a result, and that's what science is about, I guess. So, as you already heard, we are update to project Daedalus. Um, see what, after 30 years, 40 years, can be done with the new knowledge in uh, um, engineering. So, um, they started in 2009 with primary research and trade analysis, and in 2013 we decided to uh, have a design competition. That's when the Munich team entered. That was to uh, have a fusion-propelled starship that brings 150-ton payload um, to Alpha Centauri. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I'm a bit nervous. Sorry. Yeah. This is my first really large presentation. I hope it will get better through, throughout the presentation and for the next presentation. So um, what I want to say is with the design competition, the real um, concept design started where we are now co started to compete against each other and each team uh, did their own design, which is basically um, Firefly. It's a set pinch fusion propelled um, starship designed by Robert Freeland. If you have any questions about that, you can ask him. Um, we have Starship Resolution, which is ICF with um, Helium-3. That's Kelvin Long mainly. Um, then we had a UDD that uses ultra-dense deuterium, a really dense uh, form of metallic um, deuterium, and the performance would have been great, but we said, um, we're not sure about the scientific results yet, so let's skip that for now. Then we have the Zeus team, the newest team in our uh, family of designs, we heard about that, and then we have our ghost team, which is a neutron pound laser, fast ignition, deuterium, deuterium, inertial confinement fusion. It's a long title, so I'll now elaborate what that is. Um, our propulsion system architecture is we use for acceleration um, fusion propulsion only. Our ISP is not as high as Drexel's uh, or any other teams. I will talk about that, why. Um, we have 360,000 seconds and a thrust of 55 meganewtons. Then for deceleration, we use a combination of a magnetic sail and this fusion engine. But first of all, what is inertial confinement fusion? We use lasers to compress the pellet, um, like you see here. And then we have the fast ignition, that is one single laser pulse that should ignite the core and start the fusion process. 
Um, our palette is mainly deuterium deuterium. That was one of the competition requirements. Um, but we added a uh, deuterium tritium core to lower the ignition energy of the pellet. Um, I have to get closer. Um, so basically, we optimized the size of the pellet and, and the compression ratios, which we'll talk later about. But right now, for our design, we have 84 gram pellet, roughly 10 centimeters in diameter, and a high frequency of 150 hertz, so 150 fusions per second of these that equals a mass flow of 2.6 kilograms per second with that system. Um, the compression rate has to be high to achieve a um, high burn-up uh, fraction of the pellet and not lose um, deuterium to um, just going out through the nozzle. And that requires us to have high laser energies and with the laser efficiencies, even higher um, power requirements. So how are we going to do that? We have this neutron pump laser system where we basically use the neutrons from the fusion, which are a lot for deuterium deuterium, and um, have this chamber around where we have uranium oxide and neon. And in this chamber, um, the neutrons from the fusion, they fission the um, uranium oxide and the fission products, um, they, uh, they uh, excite the, the neon gas and these laser flashes are collected and then by light pipes and going into the amplifier, which is then used for the fusion. Um, go to the next part. Um, we did some calculations. So um, at first we just said basic assumption, how much neutrons are produced in the fusion, the, the, the normal reaction. But then we said, okay, we have to rework our design. We have to make it more, uh, more, uh, more thorough analysis. And came to the conclusion that a lot of neutrons um, are already shielded inside the pellet by the deuterium that is not fused in the outer parts. So we, our uh, numbers of neutrons and the energy um, got reduced, so we had to increase the size of all the other systems that required the neutrons. And that yeah, leads us to the neutron powers. We are, all these, these diagrams you see are integrated in a MATLAB simulation that gives us, on a, with a trade space analysis, an, an optimal design in the end. Um, for our specific impulse, we um, used the dataless analysis um, and tried to figure out um, is that valid or not. We said yes um, and applied it to our um, design. And what you see here, the trend is that with larger pellet um, radius and you get a higher burn-up fraction depending on the compression ratio and a higher ISP. So we thought, okay, let's do larger pellets, but you're limited by the additional mass you get for the laser system that you need to compress. So there is, um, at the overall system, there's an optimum that we determined and that led to our low ISP because you're limited by the driver energy that you need to compress the pellet. So let's go back to that. Over, short overview, you see here um, our magnetic coils. We don't have that much as in, for, you've seen in PG, for the PGMIF, the SUS design. We have a one coil system, an efficiency of uh, 75%, and um, so the, the one coil um, produces the magnetic field and the diverter magnet at the end, um, it's not shown here, um, closes this magnetic field so that a lot of the, um, the plasma is directed uh, into thrust direction where we want to have it. Um, another problem we had is that the uh, coils are so close to the fusion that they're bombarded by neutrons, so they have really massive uh, neutron shield. Um, for deceleration, I said we will go to use a magnetic sail. That is basically a superconducting loop that is um, producing a magnetic field, which is interacting with the interstellar plasma, and thereby producing a deceleration force. Um, but as I said, interstellar plasma, that's highly depending on that, and there's just assumptions about that, and it's not very dense. So we need large radius. It weighs about 1,000 tons and high um, current. But we decreased the size of that. We had um, really um, not feasible sizes, but, uh, but that was one of the steps we took, just make everything more feasible. So that, that's how a ship looks like. You see the small spacecraft and then the large magnetic sail. Yeah. If the question arises, that's not deployed during acceleration, so it just will be deployed shortly before it uh, decelerates the spacecraft. So our spacecraft, you can see here, it's roughly 1.2 kilometers long with a dust shield in front. We don't have this the pointy design. That's basically um, a plative shield um, 
impact will just evaporate the shield over time. Behind that, the payload section, here the, the, the deuterium tanks and the pellet manufacturing with a uh, thermal system to keep uh, on cryogenic temperatures. Then we have here a power system and tritium storage, tritium decays, produces heat, so we have to get rid of that. The whole thing is attached to a carbon nanotube structure, a very thin one. And here is the propulsion system with their large radiators due to uh, neutrons and x-rays that produce heat and we have to get rid of. Um, our configuration, just to um, explain wh why we chose it. So here, the fusion, we said, okay, let's get everything that is important as far away from the fusion um, as possible and use a small shield to not have too much heat input and then protect the rest of the ship. That was the main idea behind that. So the whole shield mass is, uh, is very low compared to the overall ship mass. And that's why we have the, long, the longer ship. As material, it's a polyethylene with, doped with some materials that we assume based on literature we could found on, on, on shielding material. But one thing that is very important, just wanted to mention it here, um, the total neutron power we get in radiated isotropically is 5,110 gigawatts. So for interstellar, we learned that for interstellar spaceflight gigawatts and something like this is not a large number, but uh, if you calculate then in mass, then it's, it gets heavy. So we had to add additional shielding here to protect the structural elements. So that's, coil, uh, that's the diverter mag magnet and that's the large coil. So the uranium um, oxide chamber is not shown here, just to, that we could see the actual shield. And this, produced, this configuration um, leads to 620 gigawatts of heat that we had to get rid of. Um, we did that first, in the first iteration we looked at liquid droplet radiators. I don't know if you're familiar with that. You use uh, metal droplets, shoot them into space and let them cool down, and then collect them again. The problem with that is that there were large surfaces and a lot of mass loss um, during, uh, due to evaporation. So we uh, got back and uh, developed the phase change radiators in collaboration with the, uh, the Firefly team. And now have lithium coolant with carbon-carbon fins that uh, are possible to uh, get us a specific weight of 80 kilowatts per kilogram. The radiators you see here are on the ship uh, roughly 400 meters long and on both sides one kilometer wide and weigh 8,000 tons, that's a lot but we have to get rid of the heat somewhere, and that was the best way to do it. Um, another important bus element I want to talk about is communication system. For um, interstellar communication, you have high losses, so you need a lot of uh, high gain, which is either a large antenna or um, your power system. Right now, there's a new um, power system under development within um, Project Icarus that we may use for all the designs which um, uses large antennas and to transfer a data rate of 20 gigabits per second. That's the idea behind that. Um, we thought within uh, our ghost design, we have the magnetic sail, so we can use the base structure as f from of the magnetic sail as a base structure for um, the communication system. We will look into that and for the final report, ho hopefully finish it. Um, additional bus systems we had looked at are navigation, onboard data handling, um, all the thermal control system for um, keeping the, the, pel uh, the, the, the deuterium stored. Um, pellet manufacturing is also important. Um, we had this deuterium tritium core and when you have the tritium inside then it would just melt the pellets over time and the tritium decays. So the pellets have to be pre-manufactured before they are sent into the fusion chamber. And then the pellet injection. Um, for that, we use the Daedalus approach of just a uh, magnetic gun because all the other um, technologies would have been too heavy or would have required um, uh, propellant. So, told you what the technologies were we used, how we did it. We had a lot of tweaking to do to get the ISP higher and to get our um, mission time down. So we're basically accelerating only for 2.5 years. That is good because that um, limits the exposure to, of the structure to neutrons and all the thermal loads. We reach a velocity of 2.3% uh, uh, of the light speed. That already will tell you the result of our uh, mission time, which is not 100 years. And then we're cruising for, uh, for 73.5 years, decelerate for 110 years. 
until we finally reach um, with fusion. The last bit is done with fusion, um, orbital velocities around Alpha Centauri. And the total duration is 186 years. So slightly above the, the requirement. Um, our results showed we could decrease it by at least 10 or 20 years, but that would mean um, twice or even more um, propellant. And like you see here, we're already at 1.5 million tons, roughly, 450 ton payload, mainly because of the mass of the propulsion system. The initial mass of the uranium oxide that we have to take with us is 270,000 tons, and it's used up over time, but the initial mass is really high. So that leads to a payload fraction of 0.01%, which, yeah, I wouldn't send a ship with that kind of a payload fraction. That's, just, that's not worth it. So we should go with a different design. <laughs> that's, that's my result. It's not, it's not positive, but I guess, yeah, we have to, we have to deal with it. Um, so our conclusion is that the fast ignition um, technology that we got in the competition to uh, the, what we were asked to analysis to an, to analyze in the competition um, doesn't make it in 100 years, and that our neutron energy recovery system is too heavy. So possible solutions are we use a different propulsion system, use our spacecraft bus, bus and um, add another propulsion system and start from um, all over again, or we reduce this mass of the propulsion system. So we looked at MHD generators to get um, energy back from the, from the exhaust stream, but that lowers your ISP even more. And first analysis showed that even that also that is too heavy. So there is something where um, we are now researching to find a better way of uh, recovering the energy required for compression. And then I will draw the final conclusion. So Project Icarus will come to an end soon by publishing everything that we did, um, summarizing everything and get all the designs ready. And we at Munich, our team, so two persons will try to get uh, the best design possible until that. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.